The Lady in the Woods, 1987 to 2012, by user ChaosDH, posted to r slash backwoods creepy. The following story is 100% true. All names have been changed. The years listed are the estimated dates that this story roamed free for me. It was the only time in my entire life that I ever questioned my own sanity or my own perceptions. I ask that you read this story in full, as this is one of those few cases where there is an actual ending to the story. I'm writing this today because I believe that this is a story everybody can learn from. Location, mid-sized city, located roughly two and a half hours southwest of Chicago. The town sits right on the Mississippi River, bordering the state of Iowa. The Lady in the Woods was sighted at a small park, smack dab in the middle of town. The park is surrounded by roughly four to five acres of timber. Sometime in roughly 1993 or 1994, was the first time I had ever heard about the lady in the woods. I was in the fifth grade, hanging out with some other boys on the grade school grounds. This story is your typical ghost story. At Mel Park, a child went missing after the sighting of a ghost. More specifically, the ghost of a woman dressed all in white. They didn't know the name of the child, but claimed it happened in 1987. Another boy chimed in. There was also an adult who went missing, the night after a sighting of this same ghost a few years later. In both cases, the sightings happened after the park closed, well after midnight. The park is nestled in between neighborhoods, just a couple of blocks away, our local hangout as kids. And there have even been reports of people who have moved out of their home after seeing the woman drift through the woods. There were other stories that I heard in the years after that, including witchcraft, Satan worshipping, kidnapping, murder, the occult, pretty much everything. The story gained more momentum when another boy in our class, a few months later, found a pentagram spray painted on a tree on a path near the park. We actually rode our bikes out there to see it, and it was definitely there, crudely painted in what looked like a real hurry. It was one of those things where there was no real way to know if it was part of the story or if it was put there because of the story. But when you're in the fifth grade, you rarely stop to think these things through. You only see what's in front of you. And what I was seeing was definitely creepy. May of 1995. A friend of ours named Michael lived only a block away from Mel Park. His parents decided to allow him to have a sleepover for his birthday party. He invited 10 of us boys to stay the night, just doing what boys do. God bless those parents, by the way. That night, you can imagine where this thing headed. Michael knew all about the Mel Park ghost stories. He lived the closest of all of us and had a neighbor who gave him all kinds of crazy information, or so he claimed. He rehashed a lot of the stories we had already heard and even added a few others. After some time, as the clock made its way near 1 a.m., it finally happened. One of the boys suggested we sneak out, see if we could find this lady ghost. So that's exactly what we did. We all made it outside, quiet enough, and made our way to Mel Park. Once we made it to Mel Park, we broke up into groups. A few walked on to the overgrown Little League baseball field. A few headed toward the playground equipment, near the only streetlight in the park. I and another stayed in the parking lot nearest to Michael's house. Yes, we were the skittish ones. I wish I could give you all kinds of cool things we did, but in real life, it's not that cool. Essentially, we just kind of walked around, looking, waiting. Really, we had only been there for maybe 15 or 20 minutes when it happened. I kid you not, just like the story, within minutes of us showing up. It was like a lifetime movie. There she was, in the woods to my north. I see what looks like a pale, white woman. White hair, white flowing clothes, and white pants. 
In the night, she looked like she was glowing. It was literally the perfect example of what you would think of as a ghost. I have never been so scared in my entire life. To this day, it is still the most terrifying moment I've ever been in. And that includes an automobile accident. Everyone saw her, all 10 of us. I mean, she stuck out like a sore thumb. We jetted. I mean, we ran faster than any of us had ever run before. All of us were completely silent, moving at our fastest rate toward Michael's home and safety. I could embellish here and tell you that she chased us or made a move toward us. I could make it out like her head split in half or something and bees came flying out, but none of that happened. In fact, she was facing a different way entirely. I don't believe the ghost lady even knew we were there. She looked as if she was simply peering deeper into the woods, as opposed to staring out at us frightened little boys running away terrified. That was that, we all made it back safely. We spent the rest of the night worried that this lady ghost was going to show up and kidnap us. She never showed. We went back to school and the lady of the woods became a legend. All of us share the story, all of us back each other up. We even told one of our teachers. She politely listened and then changed the subject. It was the coolest, most terrifying thing that had ever happened to us. We had one of the best campfire ghost stories in history. So time passes, like it always does. We move on from grade school to junior high and then to graduating high school. Once we got a little older, the story took a back seat to girls and just living life. I wouldn't say the story died. I know we spoke of it in passing. I know the story continued on in the grade school, at least for a short time after we left. We all moved on to college. I lost touch with all but one of the 10, though a few I have on Facebook. 2010. After coming home from college and struggling to find my way in life, I finally start to get my act together. I find a full-time job, married my now wife, got a dog, and even had a couple of kids. Eventually, we purchased our first home, which just so happens to be just blocks from my childhood house. I end up in a tiny little house two streets over from Mel Park. After those floating years, I end up back where it all started. On my days off, I walk my dog in the very park where the Lady of the Woods scared me almost to death. This is where you really start to question yourself and your senses. At 27 years old, I would stare at that location where I saw that lady glowing all those years prior and try to make sense of it all. Now older and wiser, you spend a lot more time trying to feel things out, rather than just reacting. How in the world did I see a ghost in the sixth grade with nine other people who all saw the same thing? I know it wasn't a dream. How could we be collectively dreaming? I know it wasn't imagination. It was really there. What I saw was real. But your brain has a funny way of making things fuzzy. It's hard to explain, but you start to just question everything. You know it's real, but you know it's not. That sentence shouldn't be, but that's just how my mind would read the situation. It was really something that I wrestled with a bit, just trying to figure it all out. Summer of 2012. There I am on another walk with my dog, coming up alongside the timber where I saw the lady in the woods all those years ago. I'm thinking of her again, I'm thinking of my childhood friends. I'm wondering if they ever think of that moment like I do. The thought passes as I move along a path that leads me out of the park. In front of me, a large trailer hooked up to a pickup sits on the driveway nearest the park's wooded area. There's a middle-aged man moving some things onto the trailer as I approach. He sees me and says, hello, and I say hello back. And then I decided to make small talk. I ask him if he's moving. The man responds that he has just recently sold the home. It was his parents' house and it had sold to a young couple. Closing was coming up shortly. I mention a few other things and then start to head off, but I stop because that ghost story was on my mind. I decided to ask a man that I didn't know if he knew the story. Why I did that is beyond me, 
It's definitely not something I would normally bring up in conversation. But this house was the closest one to the sighting, and I just needed confirmation that somebody else out there still knew the story. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I basically asked him if he had ever heard the ghost stories. I will never forget what happened next. The man looks at me and smiles, and he tells me, yeah, he's heard those stories plenty. I'm actually relieved he had because I hadn't actually thought through how the conversation would go if he didn't know what I was talking about. I then proceeded to give him a very short version of the story you just heard. He listened and I could tell he was interested. When finished, he takes a moment and responds. And this is what he says. I used to live in this house before the park was built. My parents raised me here. I moved out in 83, 84. I believe the park was built somewhere between 84 to 86, and my parents have been here ever since. My dad passed away in 91, and it was just my mom after that. That ghost you saw, the lady in the woods, that was my mom. I looked at him completely confused. He looked down and continued. Uh, my mom had some medical issues that started in the mid 80s and continued all the way up until she passed away just this last spring. The medicine they had her on would cause her to sleepwalk. I can't even count the number of times I received calls in the middle of the night from the police department, advising me that they had found my mother wandering in the park. I was told recently one of the neighbors moved out because they were tired of all the commotion. This went on for years. I found out from some friends that she had become a ghost story to the park. You see, my mom had a favorite robe that was all white and always slept in the same pearl silk pajamas. Everything was white. She even had white gloves she would put on from time to time. I can only imagine what that would look like in the middle of the night. That lamp over there on the playground would light her up like a Christmas tree. So at least it was never hard for the police to locate her. You see that ghost you saw? It was just my mom sleepwalking. I bet I even got a call that night. I'm speechless after hearing this. The lady in the woods was real. She wasn't a ghost though. She wasn't a dream. She was simply a woman. She was this man's mother, lonely and suffering from some medical condition that had her wandering in the woods at night. I only wish I knew more. I never saw that man again. The new couple moved in, probably oblivious to the ghost story that its previous occupant had created. So I wonder, does her legend live on? Is there still some fifth grader right now hearing the story for the first time of the lady in the woods? How she appears and kidnaps children? How there's a witch who kills all of those who see her in the middle of the night? I don't really know. 2021. I've moved from that tiny house to a new, bigger house in a new city. I no longer visit Mel Park. I never did learn that lady's name, and I always kick myself for not asking the man more questions. The thing that I find so interesting is how a story can become what it is, how one event can impact individuals like it did me. I still think of that lady all the time. When a story rolls out that seems impossible, the lady in the woods comes to my mind. Sometimes the story is real, but the context is muddled. This single event impacted my approach to everything. I listen, I take in all of the story that I can. If it seems impossible, I hold my tongue. Maybe it is impossible, or maybe it's just being interpreted wrong. Maybe it is a ghost. Or maybe it's just a lost, lonely woman searching for something in the middle of the night. Strange encounter while hunting in rural Texas posted to r slash backwoods creepy by a now deleted user. 
I was told you guys might like this story, so here you go. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005, when I was about 13 years old. It took place in a rural area, a good ways outside the town of Uvalde, Texas. The town itself was really small back then, and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew somebody who owned a deer lease that was about 1,000 acres or so, down outside of the area, and was complaining about having a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but it also gave us some quality father-son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. That car was so uncomfortable, I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try to beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something that I was never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive obviously took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anybody lease it that year and that the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life, I had been in scouts for a couple of years and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin and crapped on the floor. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out and setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for any tracks and signs of hogs and to find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they had been rooting, so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing somebody standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by the trees. This was private land, so they definitely were not supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there and nobody would be there the entire time. Not to mention, the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket we slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're hunters. This is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We were about 30 yards away now and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. The weird thing was the person was in a ski jacket and what appeared to be ski pants. Now, this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 degrees Fahrenheit outside by then, or around 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. My dad called out again. Hey, this is private property. No reaction. He told me to stay behind him and he unsnapped the clip to his pistol holder. That's all we had at the time since we were only scouting the area. The rifles were back at the cabin. Before anybody gets freaked out, he wasn't intending on shooting the guy, but the guy did have his hands in his pockets and was acting really weird and had somehow broken onto private property. So protection, you know? We approached the person's right side and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. 
I stayed and crouched down. I watched him circle around to the front of the man, all while talking to him, asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man, and my dad stood straight up with a confused look on his face. I called out and said, what's wrong? And he called back and said, it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring. And as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes that it was wearing were brand new. No dust, no sap, bird droppings, no sign at all of being outside for any more than a day at most. At that moment, I looked at my dad and I could see him get worried. Almost immediately after, I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched. And I knew that my dad felt it too. I wanted to start crying. I remember suddenly feeling so scared, like a primal fear. My dad walked up to me and whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified, so it felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was only about 45 minutes at most. After returning, we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said he's never had an issue with people on his property because it was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having somebody there that we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. The buddy said he had no idea what the mannequin was all about, that he hadn't put it there and that of course he hadn't tried to prank us. He wasn't the type to do that anyway. After we got back home, we talked and my dad hadn't been able to sleep the night before either. We had both had that same feeling, but he didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping too. I thought he was sleeping, so I didn't wake him up. Turns out the next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property. He never found any trace of anyone and he never found a mannequin. The story still makes my hair stand on end. No idea what all that was about, but Part of me thinks it was some kind of trap or something. Not the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me in the woods, actually, but definitely top three. Whoever was out there, whatever they wanted, I'm just so glad that my dad had the head on him to leave. Echoes of Laughter I've always found solace in the woods near my home in a small New England town, a place where the dense canopy of trees and the soft, earthy path beneath my feet offered a respite from the noise of daily life. It was during one of these escapes, on a day when the autumn air was crisp and the leaves painted a mosaic of fiery hues, that I experienced something that would forever alter my perception of these woods. The day was like any other, with the sun casting dappled shadows through the branches. The only sounds were the crunch of leaves underfoot, maybe the distant call of a bird. I was deep in thought. I was just pondering the turns my life had taken. Then a sound sliced through the solitude, a child's laughter, clear and unmistakable. It was a joyful sound, but in the context of the deserted woods, it was unnervingly out of place. I stopped dead in my tracks, listening intently. The laughter came again, this time seemingly closer. My initial confusion quickly turned to concern. What was a child doing out here alone, so far from any of the town's homes? The thought that somebody might be lost or in trouble spurred me into action. I began to search the area from where I thought the laughter had originated. 
As I moved through the underbrush, calling out with reassurances that I meant no harm, the laughter continued. It seemed to dance around me, now from one direction, then from another, as elusive as the shifting breeze. Despite my best efforts, I saw no sign of anybody. The laughter, so full of life, was juxtaposed against the stillness of the woods, creating an eerie atmosphere that sent shivers down my spine. Still, I was determined to find the source. I ventured further, the laughter guiding me deeper into the woods than I had ever been before. The trees here grew closer together, their branches intertwining like clasped fingers, casting the ground into perpetual twilight. The air grew colder, and a sense of unease began to settle over me. The laughter, once innocent, now carried a mocking tone, as if enjoying a game only it understood. After what felt like hours, I found myself in a clearing I had never seen before. The laughter stopped as abruptly as it had started, leaving a silence behind that was so heavy it felt like a physical presence. I stood there, catching my breath, looking around for any sign of life, but there was none. The feeling of being watched was overwhelming, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. It was then that I noticed the gravestones, half hidden by overgrowth, scattered around the clearing. My heart sank as the realization sunk in. This was the forgotten resting place of the early settlers of the town, their existence erased by time and memory. The names on the gravestones were barely legible, worn away by centuries of weather, but the dates were clear enough. These were the graves of children, victims of the harsh realities of colonial life. The laughter had led me to this place, a hidden monument to lives cut short, their joy frozen in time. As I stood there, a deep sorrow filled me, not just for the children who had died, but for the loss of innocence that the laughter in the woods represented. It felt as though the laughter was their way of reaching out, a reminder that they too once lived and played and loved. Even if all that remained of them were these weathered stones and the echoes of their laughter. The Cave of Unseen Horrors. My fascination with unexplored places led me to a dense forest on the outskirts of my hometown. It was a place rumored to be untouched by modern hands. It was here, amidst the thick underbrush and ancient trees, that I discovered an inconspicuous cave entrance, partially hidden by moss and the overgrowth of the decades. The thrill of discovery pulsed through me as I prepared to enter, completely unaware of what awaited me. Had I known what I was getting into, perhaps I would have turned around. But perhaps it would have been even more motivating. I can't really say. All I know is that I did enter, and what happened, happened. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The cave was surprisingly spacious, its walls stretched out and upward into the darkness. I flicked on my flashlight. The beam cut through the gloom and revealed the first of the paintings that adorned the cave's interior. At first glance, they seemed to just be simple prehistoric art pieces, the kind of rudimentary figures and shapes one might expect in such a place. But as I ventured farther, the nature of the paintings changed, and so did the feeling in the air. What was once excitement very quickly turned into a growing sense of dread, that feeling that you shouldn't be where you are. The paintings depicted scenes of daily life at first, hunting, gathering, the camaraderie of what I assumed were the cave's ancient inhabitants. But as I progressed deeper into the cave, the scenes took on a darker tone. 
The figures, once depicted in harmonious activities, were now shown in acts of violence and despair. Among these were images of creatures that didn't resemble any animal or thing that I ever knew of. Twisted forms that seemed to leap out of the walls with an unsettling realism. One series of paintings in particular caught my attention and refused to let go. It told a story that began with the arrival of a dark figure depicted as a shadowy silhouette much larger than the human figures surrounding it. This figure brought with it other creatures, the same monstrous forms I had seen earlier. What followed was a tale of chaos. The humans, armed with spears and arrows, clashing with these beings in a desperate struggle for survival. The most disturbing part was the final scene. It showed a mass of these creatures, victorious, standing over a group of humans who were kneeling, their postures indicative of surrender or worship. Above this scene, painted with a precision that belied the primitive tools that must have created it, was a larger depiction of the dark figure, its arms raised, almost like it was triumphant. The detail that made me stop in my tracks, the thing I'll never get out of my head, was the unmistakable depiction of joy on the creature's face, if such a monstrosity could be said to have a face. I stood there in the dim light, the silence of the cave suddenly threatening as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. The air felt heavier, charged with an energy that seemed to come from the paintings themselves. It was like the emotions of fear and despair and malicious triumph were still alive. The realization that these paintings were not merely artistic expressions, but a historical record of some forgotten horror was overwhelming. I felt an urgent need to leave, to escape the oppressive atmosphere of the cave, the gaze of that dark figure that seemed to be turning its attention toward me, even from the static painting. Once outside, the brightness of the day was blinding. The sounds of the forest were almost disorienting after being in the silence of the cave. Everything seemed loud and overwhelming, and it took me a moment to catch my breath. My mind raced to process what I had just seen. This forest was once a place of beauty and mystery, it was enchanting to me, a place I could go to feel safe. And now it felt ominous, as though it concealed truths too terrifying to comprehend. I've never returned to that cave, nor have I spoken about it until now. The experience left me with many questions, but I've never really done any work to find the answers. I don't really want to, I don't think. That painting in that cave told a disturbing story, one that challenges every perception of history and humanity's place within it that I had ever known before. I think if I let myself, I could think about that painting and what it means forever. But that obsession, I fear, would only lead me down a road that might make me one of the people on my knees worshiping something that seeks my doom.